Hi, my name is Sarah Norsworthy, and I am the Social Emotional Learning Specialist at the Maine Department of Education. And this video presentation has been designed for um, Maine, for Maine educators, family, community members to understand a little bit more about what social emotional learning is and why it matters. So you may be watching this for professional learning. You may be watching this um, to learn more about what's happening in your local schools. Um, whatever your purpose is, this is a great place to start if you know um, a little bit about social emotional learning. If you know nothing about it, if this is your first introduction to it, this is exactly where you want to be starting. Um, if you're looking more particularly for how to implement social emotional learning, um, this is not the place to be. Uh, please look at our website when we will be posting soon um, 201 videos that are designed to help more with implementation. Uh, please reach out to me, Sarah Norsworthy at the Maine Department of Education if you have any questions. Um, and if we can support your learning or understanding of social emotional learning uh, any further. In today's presentation, which is being recorded in October of 2022, we will be looking at current research um, that was done, some survey, Surveys were administered to Maine high school students in 2021, some MIAS data. It came out very recently. So if you are watching this many months from now, um, there may be more current data to look for. The MIAS data was just released, and that is the current data that we have on the mental health um, of our students. And we're going to be looking at a few data points uh, from Maine high school students in their own voices. And, you know, just um, be aware that that can bring up feelings. You know, we're gonna be learning here together. And as you'll see in the presentation, uh, learning, when we're engaged in learning, we have emotional responses. And so notice right now how you're feeling in your body. Take a deep breath, uh, shrug your shoulders. Make sure you're kind of sitting comfortably or standing comfortably. Um, and notice how that, how your feelings change. Uh, notice what, what captures your attention. What has you wondering why? Um, what do you think this information uh, might mean for you in your local context, local community? So I'm gonna be pausing um, this video at certain points, um, encouraging you to talk with a colleague if you are watching this with a, a group of people or one other a thinking partner. Um, if you are watching this on your own, I'm gonna encourage you to jot down some reflections or potentially to just you know, reflect in your head, right in your own brain, um, sort of how, how you're thinking and feeling. And there'll be some particular points where we will draw um, on the Harvard Project Zero thinking routine of what do we notice, what do we see, what do we think about what we see, and then what do we wonder, um, how might we act? Um, and particularly in this presentation, how we feel. So, um, Pay attention to your feelings and notice what comes up for you um, because social emotional learning is something that, as you'll see, we do with students. We are teaching and learning in social contexts and when we learn emotions surface. And so how we harness those emotions, how we manage them, how we design learning so that it is supportive for students um, emotionally, uh, connecting them and sense their sense of self and others socially, and really um, working hard ourselves to think critically and make the best decisions with the information we have. And so hopefully this information, again, on social emotional learning and why it matters um, will be helpful to you in your practice. And please reach out with any questions. So we're going to jump right in um, to some of the MIAS data. And here is the first question um, that I am sharing with you, not the first question of the survey. Uh, the first question, the first data point we're gonna look at asks, um, it asks students, how often do you feel that people at your school care about students and encourage them? What percentage of students do you think answered most of the time or always? So what percentage of students do you think answered most of the time or always when asked, how often do you feel that people at your school care about students and encourage them? So the 
answer was 44.9%. And I'll share with you that I asked um, my child, who is a high school student, what they uh, thought the answer would be across the state of Maine, and they were within a couple of percentage points. Um, so I was, I was curious about that because, of course, what this means is that if about 45% of students feel that people care about students and encourage them in their school, that means 55% um, aren't feeling that way. And that's data that we need to pay attention to. The next data point we're going to look at um, is this one. Students were asked how often during the past 30 days was their mental health not good? And for the purpose of this survey, mental health um, being not good included feeling stressed, anxious, or depressed. What percentage of Maine high school students do you believe answered most of the time or always? So it's about 33, 34% said during the past 30 days, about a third of them said that their mental health was often not good. So we know research tells us, as does our own experience, that when we talk about, um, when we talk about our feelings, it helps us process and hold them. And so students were asked, during the past 12 months, when you felt sad or hopeless, from whom did you get help? What percentage do you think Maine high school students name their friends as the people to whom they turn to for support? So 17 and a half percent turn to their friends. How many do you think turn to their parents? An adult relative, a caregiver? About 11%. And how many turn to the educators, school staff, the teachers in their lives? About 1.4%. So these data points were connected to really show I'm going back over them now in reverse order, right? That we know that there are a fair number of students, right? More than half um, of them that are not feeling, right? Feel that it is not often that they are feeling cared about and encouraged in school settings. They're telling us about a third of them that their mental health wasn't good. It's not good. It wasn't good in 2021. And that when they're feeling like their mental health is not good, they're turning to their friends a little less than twice as much as they're turning to their parents and relatives, caregivers, and they're turning to school staff you know, about 1% of the time. And so by practicing teaching and learning social emotional literacies, um, we hope that we can see improvement in supporting the students of Maine through social emotional learning. So I work in the Office of School and Student Supports, and our work is to ensure that Maine schools are inclusive, they're healthy and safe, right? and that means feelings too, that they're supportive communities where every student thrives. We endeavor to coordinate resources and programs that promote equitable, psychosocial, physically, environmentally healthy school communities for all. And so, as I had said in the beginning, right, this information that we provide is intended for parents and administrators, educators, legislators. I believe I did not include legislators in the beginning. So if you are a legislator and watching this, um, please forgive me and welcome. Uh, and also other stakeholders within their focus areas. So we provide information and guidance. And this is our information on social emotional learning. So the Office of School and Student Supports uh, has several teams on it and I am on the Climate, Culture and Resilience team. And our team provides trauma-informed resources in support of developing safe, again, that means physically and emotionally safe and inclusive educational communities. I'm privileged to work with Kelly Doyle Bailey, 
our social emotional learning specialist. Uh, and the two of us are here to support your work in learning and practicing um, in socially and emotionally informed and literate ways. We will meet you where you are. Are you accessing our free content? We'll get to that at the end. Um, do you want some support with practices? Those would be the 201 videos or Kelly and I are available to meet with you, meet with your school, um, meet with your district, planning for the future, uh, considering how to embed social emotional learning in your curriculum, right? This is something that we teach explicitly and that we practice all day long. And so we can design um, our teaching and our assessing and our being with students and community in socially emotionally literate ways. And um, we can do it in socially emotionally harmful ways. And so if you're looking for ways to, to um, lift the social emotional learning or just wanna process and talk about what you're doing and if it's aligned with what we know are best practices, um, reach out to us, we are here. SEL is about knowing and telling our truths. And that means about our feelings too. Our emotions matter. I believe I shared in the beginning um, that we know that when we have rich emotional experiences, we develop skills which positively impact the lives of our students. Right? For students to have an increased chance of success in learning and in their lives, we have to create space for emotional responses because emotionalist learning can happen. We can learn discrete facts, we can memorize things rotely, but learning that way holds a little lifelong value. So when we're engaged in learning, we have emotional responses. So notice, has anything coming up for you? Are you having an emotional response to this piece of information, right? There is lifelong learning and skill development embedded in the neural pathways, right? And how our brain grows when we learn and understand um, that emotions are involved and when we access emotional intelligence while we're learning. So the Maya's data um, that we looked at in the beginning um, really points to this idea of a connection gap. You know, we have talked, um, we used to talk about an achievement gap. Uh, Dr. Gloria Ladson Billings uh, introduced the language of an opportunity gap. And Dr. Tawanda Harris um, now is asking us to consider, do we have a learning gap or do we have a connection gap? Social emotional learning is designed to bridge and really to, to fill in that gap. Social emotional learning refers to a wide range of skills, attitudes, and behaviors that affect student success in school and in life. And these are often called soft skills. They're the skills that we don't really have current assessments that measure that certainly the tests that, that I was given, right, a long time ago, uh, multiple choice, fill in the blank tests, um, certainly are not measuring a lot of critical thinking, emotion management, conflict resolution, decision-making, teamwork. These are the things that we know support student learning and are skills that are important to develop. They round out student education. They impact academic success, employability, right? how we feel about ourselves, our self-esteem, our relationships, and our civic and community engagement. And we will be talking about, um, talking about each of those areas and looking at some data that supports the positive impact of social emotional learning on all of these areas. So first we're gonna watch a short clip um, put together by CASEL, the Collaborative for Academic and Social Emotional Learning that describes sort of five core competencies or sort of big umbrellas, big ideas in social emotional learning. Um, they offer a framework for us to think about social emotional learning and to think about where we're providing opportunities um, for students to learn about and practice these five core competencies. And then the different settings where that learning uh, and practice, the teaching learning and practice may happen. So we're gonna go ahead and watch this video. Uh, let me just get that started. Here we go.
Think about the young people in your lives and all the different places where they're learning about themselves, how to relate to others, and work together on goals. How can we intentionally create learning experiences that will help all young people develop and maintain positive relationships, become lifelong learners, and contribute to a more caring, just world? Educators, researchers, community members, families, and the students themselves agree what we need is social and emotional learning, or SEL. SEL is the process through which young people and adults acquire and apply the knowledge, skills, and attitudes that help us to understand ourselves, connect with others, achieve our goals, and support our communities. We all need opportunities to learn and engage in environments where we feel safe, valued, and a sense of belonging. So how does SEL help schools, families, and communities work together so that all young people have these kinds of learning experiences and achieve success in education, careers, and life? CASEL's framework identifies five areas of competence that together help us develop a healthy sense of who we are, manage stress, understand the views of others, and work together to create schools and communities where everyone can grow their strengths and interests. Self-awareness is about how we think about ourselves and who we are. It includes understanding our culture, our thoughts, feelings, and what we believe we're capable of, and understanding how these things can influence our behaviors and beliefs. Self-management is the ability to manage those emotions, thoughts, and actions in different situations so that we can achieve individual and collective goals. This includes coping with stress and anxiety, persevering through challenges, and taking action to create positive change. Social awareness is how we understand others, how we learn to take different perspectives and empathize even with people who are different from us. It also includes understanding how the broader norms and systems around us influence how we develop and create a sense of belonging. Relationship skills are how we connect and engage effectively with others and how we form lasting friendships and connections. This includes communicating clearly, solving problems together, managing conflict and disagreements, and standing up for ourselves and the rights of others. Lastly, responsible decision-making is how we put it all together to make caring and constructive choices. This includes thinking critically about consequences, analyzing the impact of our actions on ourselves and others, and identifying solutions that support our collective well-being. We continue to develop and practice SEL throughout our lives and can adapt and apply these competencies across different contexts and cultures. How we develop SEL is impacted by our environments, which is why we need to work together across classrooms, schools, families, and communities. In the classroom, students can be explicitly taught SEL skills and also can practice and apply SEL during core subjects like discussing different perspectives in social studies and language arts, or collaboratively problem solving in science or math. SEL is most effective when supported by evidence-based programs and trusting relationships where students are treated as partners in their learning. Beyond the classroom, SEL can be intentionally promoted throughout the school experience, from the way they're greeted in the morning to how discipline practices are carried out and how adults themselves develop and model positive relationships and the SEL competencies. Outside of school, families and caregivers provide the earliest and ongoing learning and interactions for their children. So it's important that schools listen to and authentically partner with families to help shape SEL priorities and strategies for supporting their children. Similarly, when schools partner with community organizations to align their efforts, SEL opportunities can be strengthened and students benefit even more. With SEL, we can help create schools and learning spaces where all young people feel connected, inspired, engaged, and ready to contribute to the world around them. Okay. So take a moment pause the video if you'd like. This is a great time for you to stretch, to think about what you just watched, 
what do you take away from that? What's an overall feeling? What came up in your body? So take a minute, the questions, what did you notice? What do you think? What do you wonder? What do you feel? So take a moment and pause. And when you're ready, go ahead and unpause. Okay. So welcome back, or if you stayed, <laughs> glad you're still here. So we just watched a quick clip put out by Castle that over was an overview of the five core competencies and the settings where we think about um, social emotional learning is happening. And we want to take, I want to take just a moment and talk to you about the language of SEL. And this is another place where I do want you to practice uh, the notice, think, and wonder. So as you're watching, right, I want you to practice what you notice, what you wonder, and what you feel. So there are different options for language, and you'll find that different people use different words when talking about these competencies. So when you think about self-awareness, you can also consider that identity, understanding your identity, the assets that your identity brings into the spaces you're in, and also the identity right, of others. Self-management, agency, right? What can you do? What actions can you take? Social awareness, right? What does it mean to belong, to be aware of the group? Um, how do you belong? Relationship skills, which you can also think of as collaborative problem solving, right? When we're negotiating our time and space and feelings and actions with other people, we are always collaboratively problem solving. And then thinking about responsible decision making which is really curiosity, right? The what if, what if I did this? What are the consequences? What's the impact? And so just notice um, and wonder and just check in with yourself on the language. What language resonates for you? Again, a great place to pause and talk as a group or reflect for yourself. Some of you who have um, backgrounds in the classroom in schools as I do, I've been a classroom teacher, literacy coach, interventionist, tech integrator. Um, you know, the words, when I think about identity and problem solving and curiosity, right? This is, this is often the work um, thinking about in literacy, right? Thinking about character traits, character growth. Um, we spend a lot of time, right, on curiosity in all domains of academics in our classrooms. We know that in classrooms, we have to work um, at creating a sense of belonging. Um, solving problems collaboratively, you know, and what is, um, what do we expect our, our students uh, to demonstrate in terms of agency? What's our own agency? What are we in control of? What are we not in control of? So um, for me as an educator, this is language that resonates, um, that resonates for me. So coming back into this slide, um, I just want to highlight that the CASEL language for SEL is on the left, and then alternative language, which is offered to us uh, by researchers connected to CASEL, um, offer a, an updated, uh, updated option for language. And so um, you can use these, you can use these in exchange for each other. Um, some of you may find that one resonates more than the other. It's curious to think about why. It's interesting. I'm curious. So uh, social emotional learning is the process of learning the knowledge, skills, and attitudes to develop healthy identities, manage our emotions, achieve goals, feel and show empathy, establish and maintain supportive relationships, and make responsible and caring decisions. Social emotional learning can help address various forms of inequity empower young people and adults to co-create, right, to work together. I think the video talked about partnering to create thriving schools and contributing to a safe, healthy, and just community. This is the work of the Office of School um, Supports, and so we are here to support this work, um, and, and SEL is really something that people, as you'll see, bring into all aspects of their lives. So SEL is something that we learn about, we learn what it is, 
we learn as tools for how to practice it, and then we practice it, right? We teach and learn about SEL, and we teach and learn with SEL. And this means adults too. We know that teachers with high levels of social competence are better able to protect themselves from burnout. They develop nurturing relationships with their students. Their role model behavior of how to be with their colleagues and peers, with students, with parents, with people in the community, right? When they serve, when we as teachers serve as role models, that supports our own practice because as students look to us for how to act and be in socially and emotionally supportive ways, and then they learn from our behavior and put some of those actions and language and practice into practice, um, then that helps create classroom spaces that are healthier for us to be in as well as for our students to be in. Um, and it's important that that educators really right that all of us on planet Earth um, learn how to regulate our emotions for our own benefit um, and for the benefit of others. So how are teachers socially and emotionally supported? How is teacher social and emotional learning developed in your context? We know that teachers who possess social and emotional competencies are more likely to stay in the classroom longer. Hey, this data, this slide was created before pandemic, before this year, when we know that there are many schools that are understaffed or working sort of right at the brink, knowing that if there are educators, um, administrators who are absent, that critical parts of students' days are going to be missed. You know, everybody in school uh, and schools has a has a job that benefits the well-being of students and educators. And when anyone's missing, there is an impact. So we know that these social emotional competencies protect our profession. How are they being supported? developed in your context. Administrators, this isn't just true for teachers, right? If you're watching this and you're an administrator, your social competencies protect you too. Right? Anybody watching this, you can fill in that blank. As a human, social emotional competencies protect you. How are you being supported? How is your learning being developed? So this is one of those times I'm going to ask you to take a moment and pause Talk with a thought partner, reflect on paper or in your brain, on your heart about how you're learning about and practicing right, social emotional literacy. And how is your practice and learning being supported? What is the social and emotional learning environment like for adults? We matter too. If we are not healthy and regulated, it's very likely that there are students in our spaces who won't be either. So we know that there are statistically significant associations between the competencies that kindergartners hold in the social emotional learning domains and outcomes that they have as young adults. We know that kindergartners who are stronger in SEL competencies are more likely to graduate from high school, complete a college degree, and obtain stable employment in young adulthood. They are less likely to live in public housing, receive public assistance, to be involved in police and in a detention facility. And it is important to note that this slide uh, that was crafted by Castle um, was controlled for demographics, for socioeconomic status, for race, ethnicity, um, and other identifiers. What do you notice? What do you wonder about this? If like me, right, you're like, okay, well, if they have it in kindergarten. If we have it in kindergarten, fantastic. But what if we don't? Well, the good news here is that SEL is teachable. We can teach it explicitly and we can practice it. And we can do that in many contexts, in our classroom schools, our families, and our community. 
And when we do take the time to invest in social emotional learning, um, one study showed the, when it looked at six evidence-based programs an 11 to one return for every dollar invested, right? So when these competencies were present, when the humans who were looked at um, for this study, right, were assessed to have socially and emotionally literate ways of being, there were cost savings in terms of interventions, remediations, and dropout prevention. So social emotional learning has been in the news. Um, it would be remiss um, and it would be glaring if we didn't talk about that just for a moment in this video and you didn't talk about it amongst yourselves. Um, we know that there is pushback publicly to social emotional learning happening, period. Happening in schools, absolutely. Um, we know that there are curriculums that adjust for what those um, political views are. We know that Maine is a, uh, a state with local control. And so what the priorities are of your social emotional learning in your school, um, you get to set those, right? Your community sets your priorities. And SEL is set by local priorities. It's responsive. So um, it's not one size fits all. So you want to make sure, um, we want to make sure that we're seeking input from people with diverse perspectives in our schools and communities who can strengthen um, our knowledge of what is needed to be taught, what is needed to be learned, and I'll add what needs to be practiced. So uh, when you think for a minute about what some key priorities are, um, you might want to pause and do that before I suggest a couple um, or afterwards here. But be thinking, what are, what are key priorities that you might think about in your classroom, school, community, perhaps in your family? For some, it might be academics. For others, college and career readiness. Could be both. Could be all of these, right? Equity, mental health, and civic learning. Community engagement. So SEL can help to support these priority areas and more. So as you look at this, reflect for a minute. Again, this is a great time to pause. Which areas jump out at you in your community as areas of need? What data might you use to understand more? Do you have tools for that? Hmm. And we can talk about that. So reflect for a minute. And if you're just staying with me, thanks for still being here. So in the film that we watched, the short clip, um, it went over the five broad interrelated, right, overlapping areas of competence for social emotional learning, right? Self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making. This is a slide that sums them up in about one sentence. So self-awareness um, is about understanding uh, one's emotions, thoughts, and values, and how those emotions, thoughts, and values, how they influence behavior across contexts. We know that people behave differently in different spaces. And this is one of the places where we can begin to think about why, when that's true for you. Why? What is it about that context? What is it about that time? What is it Right, what is it that makes that change for you? Self-management, shockingly, is about managing one's um, emotions and thoughts and behaviors in different situations to achieve your goals and aspirations, right? So it's about um, sort of keeping, keeping yourself um, on track for optimal flow, happiness, contentment, right? Um, how, can, how can you stay balanced and grounded? Social awareness is understanding the perspectives right, of other people and empathizing with them. We cannot walk in someone else's shoes, but we can empathize with the feelings that they tell us come up when they walk in their shoes. We can't walk in someone else's shoes, right? You're never going to be able to have the experience of someone else. But when we empathize and recognize that we understand what sadness, what, what frustration, what joy, what love, what cooperation, right? What it feels like to be in those states. Um, we can understand, right? How we work together collectively, socially um, 
especially when we have, have come from diverse backgrounds, right? We have a lot of commonalities in our values and our emotions and our feelings. And so we wanna understand and believe the perspective and experiences of others um, because it really allows us to then negotiate healthy relationships, right? To establish them and to maintain them um, and to navigate settings where there are people with multiplicities of diversity, right? When we say diversity, oftentimes we're talking about race and ethnicity. Um, we're not, in this case, we're talking about any kind of diversity, right? And that is something that is true. We are all very much the same and we are all very much different. It's kind of what makes it fun, right? We get to learn about ourselves and other people um, from and with, right? From and with other people. So the other, the last competency um, is right when we take all of this knowledge and we use it um, to be curious, to make responsible decision makings, to think about the what ifs and the consequences so we can make caring and constructive choices about our personal behavior and social interactions across, again, a diversity across time and space with different people. So a word on empathy, right? Empathy is really what we use to close that emotional gap connection. So when Dr. Tawanda Harris talks about a connection gap versus um, a learning gap or questions of maybe it's a both and, um, empathy is what we use to create connection, to fill in that gap um, and to create a shared experience. And that experience does not mean the same things happen to us but we have a shared experience of the emotions that were brought up, right? We have commonalities in our emotions. And so this graphic uh, is what Castle presents. And so we have the sense of this nested, um, this, this holistic model, um, which centers social emotional learning um, is happening with instruction and in the classroom being part of school-wide culture and practices and policies, right? We can look at our behaviors and we can also look at our policies. Are they socially and emotionally literate? Um, thinking about how we partner with family and caregivers and thinking about how we can look um, outside of, of schools and families for a community, right? Places to support social emotional learning. So these next slides are going to go into each of these competencies with a little bit more detail. Right, so if we think about self-awareness as the ability to understand your own self, your emotions and thoughts and values and how they influence our behavior, right? This talks about integrating who we are personally and socially, right? That's a big one for kids. Um, how are, how are um, our students, um, our young humans um, integrating, right? Who they are in their hearts and in their heads and who they are socially. Right? What assets do they bring? What cultural, and personal, and linguistic assets? Um, you know, identifying your emotions, right? Just naming your emotions can make a big difference if you're feeling dysregulated. So making sure we had the language and understanding to understand our own emotions, right? Linking those feelings and values and thoughts, um, being effective, being able to be aware of yourself and how yourself influences how you act. And knowing, right, that we grow and we change, we have that growth mindset. Um, maybe we're not getting it quite yet, but there is right, another opportunity. And really thinking about that sense of purpose, right, developing interests that are in line and allow us to tap into our personal, cultural, and linguistic assets. Social emotional learning helps students understand different perspectives and to share ideas. It's not a way to teach a specific political agenda. Again, social emotional learning is in the news. It's in the news in the realm of politics. But it is not a way to teach a political agenda. It is a way to work to understand our different perspectives and where we are aligned in our values, right? And in our hopes and aspirations. And this is something that's really critical to do in a participatory democracy. The United States is a democracy, right? Our, our government requires that we understand the perspectives of others and work together to have a functioning government. And so um, this kind of learning is not about learning how, right? 
how to behave. It's not dictating any kind of a political agenda, just as helping us understand um, how to think about ourselves and how to think about other people. Right? And then how to manage those thoughts and emotions and behaviors that we have in different situations. Right? How do we identify that we need and use stress, man stress management strategies, right? Those deep breaths, right? Use music, exercise, movement, reflection, quiet time, conversation, right? How do we set goals? How do we organize ourselves and plan for success with organization? Right? How do we take initiative? How do we really like choose how to act? Right? How to use our power in our world. And then the social awareness piece, the perspective of others, right? Understanding that perspective of others across different backgrounds and cultures and contexts to feel compassion, right? And to understand that people have different perspectives and different experiences, to trust them when they tell us about them. And to begin to understand those broad historical and, and social norms, the reasons why we act the way we act and understand where we can find support. Seeing the strength in others, gratitude, identifying what's just and what's unjust, how things align with your values. Right. So if you know yourself, then how does yourself show up in the world? Where is it aligned and where is it in conflict? Right. And recognizing when a lot, a lot is being asked and where the opportunities are for connection. Relationship skills, right? connection. So how do we, once we connect, establish and maintain healthy and supportive relationships? Again, particularly with those who have different experiences with, than ours. Right? How do we communicate? How do we practice teamwork and resolve conflicts, resist pressures, show leadership, offer and seek support in respectful and responsible ways with healthy boundaries? Right? I think about those students who are relying on each other when they're feeling like their mental health isn't great. Can we help? or assist, right, point those students to other resources so that students aren't carrying the burden of each other's mental health. How do we stand up for others? SEL promotes and builds relationships and skills for healthy well-being. It's not therapy. This is a tier one. This is learning that is appropriate for um, all students. This is not an individual therapy delivered by a clinician uh, in practice with training. This is something that we practice as classroom teachers, as administrators, as adults in schools, as caregivers, right, as people in our community. This is not therapy. It happens across many contexts and it can be explored by anyone. This intentional social emotional teaching and learning and practice. Right. We have to know what it is, know how to do it, and then have so much time practicing it. Decision making, right? Doing this in a responsible way so that it's caring and constructive. Right. How do we show curiosity? How do we practice being open minded? That can be tricky. Right. How do we make reasoned judgments? Right. How do we take time and patience? That's part of managing our own emotions, right? And behaviors. But how do we? How do we harness, right, and leverage that ability to know ourselves to then make reasoned judgments, to identify solutions, to anticipate and evaluate the consequences of one's actions, right? How do we intentionally problem solve in mindful ways where we're not being ruled and governed by our emotions, but in our understanding of our emotions and then, right, the context that they're showing up in? How do we promote? our own well-being and that of others? What's our job? What's somebody else's? Right? Is this my job? Is a question that can be really valuable to ask yourself. And as many of us, especially in helping professions, have to practice 
knowing sometimes it's not your job, right? And that's part of your well-being and the well-being of the organization and communities that you're part of. And really thinking about um, the impacts of the decisions that are made by ourselves and by others that we're around. Okay. So social emotional learning, in addition to being healthy, supports academic performance, right? It makes sense. Healthy humans are going to be able to take in more information, to connect it. We're going to have more bandwidth and space to learn new things, to manage the feelings that come up when we're learning new things, to remember things, right? When we're healthy and when we're balanced, we are simply uh, able to be more aware, to notice and to observe what we're learning, what's around us. And SAL particularly um, has us thinking about, again, emotional responses to learning, right? That engagement. It's not a distraction from academics, right? We know learning happens in social contexts. Learning brings up feelings. Therefore, learning is social emotional. So in some ways we can think about SEL or social emotional learning as really, right, learning how to learn about ourselves, others, the world, and content. It supports deep listening. And I, I really love uh, the words of Holiday Phillips, the kind of listening that might happen deep late at night under the moon, that kind of listening that settles into your bones and your body, right? And if you're ever looking for graphics on um, to support presentations that you're giving or in your classroom, Sylvia Duckworth's art um, is really a gift to us. And so Sylvia um, Duckworth shows, right, different levels of listening here. And when you're listening with that heart, um, there really is an effort, right? You're in this flow. Um, we've talked about the empathy, right? Listening to empathize happens through social emotional learning. We talked about responsible decision-making and curiosity, right? That listening to evaluate, listening to know when to speak, right? Managing your emotions. So. Each of those competencies helps us to develop deeper levels of listening. So social emotional learning buffers against mental health risks. How does it do that? Well, through building and maintaining healthy relationships, safe environments, right, physically and emotionally, and the skills to handle and manage the feelings and thoughts that come up, right, based on our own actions and the actions of others. Parents know this. 87% of parents, and this is pre-pandemic data, I need to say on these slides here, 87% of parents believe SEL is important in helping children navigate today's world. 87%. Three out of five parents would prioritize social emotional learning, right? It's more important than academics. Although, and this is really important, it is not a true choice. It's not social emotional learning or academics. We don't have social emotional learning and practice time and academic time. Social emotional well-being and learning contributes to academic success. They go hand in hand. So we do teach social emotional learning explicitly but we reinforce it and practice it in our role modeling and in our choices and in classrooms, right? And in families, we're often narrating it too. I'm doing this because talking about our actions, right? Giving a window into our inner thoughts um, and using ourselves as models um, for the young humans um, who are around us and learning from us all the time. 73% of school counselors say that SEL is as important, as important as developing academic knowledge for success, long-term success. Principals, right, teachers, educators, right, they see, we see this, right, in our classrooms, students who are curious, who are regulated, who can just go with the flow because we know in classrooms rarely are any two days the same. Okay, when we have the skills and the tools to navigate that, right, learning is improved, outcomes are improved, academics are improved, school culture and climate 
is improved. Right? Again, administrators, teachers, and parents believe social emotional learning is just as important as academic learning. One of the things that it is the most important for improving are negative student behaviors like bullying. Okay. Teachers and administrators highlight that, and school safety is highlighted by parents. But really, it's about how we are acting with other people. So now we're going to look at a little bit more of the MIAS data. Six and a half percent of Maine high school students reported that they did not go to school on at least one of the past 30 days because they felt they would be unsafe at school or on their way to or from school. So that's six and a half percent overall of all the Maine high school students who responded to this 2021 survey. When we look at the data by ethnicity, we see that 10.1% of Hispanic students and 6.3% of non-Hispanic students reported that they did not go to school on at least one of the past 30 days because they felt they would be unsafe at school or on their way to or from school. What do you think the racial data look like? When we break this data out by the construct of race, we see that 19.8% Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander students, 11.1% of American Indian or Alaska Native students, Black or African American students, multiracial students, 8.1% of Asian students, and 6.1% of white students reported not going to school in at least one of the past 30 days because they felt they would be unsafe at school or on their way to or from school. When you look at this data, how does it feel? Does anything surprise you? At some bullying data. 16.1% of Maine high school students who were asked in 2021 said yes, they had been bullied on school property during the past 12 months. 16.1% had been bullied at school during the past 12 months. What do you think the percentage was for transgender students? How many of Maine high school students who identify as transgender answered yes? Does the number surprise you? 32.7, almost 33%. Okay, that is a little over a 100%, right? It's double the number of high school students who said that they had been bullied on school property, reported bullying when they identified as transgender. So as students are being bullied, students were also asked, what are the chances you would intervene or defend someone being verbally abused or bullied? So 60% said that it was a pretty good chance or a very good chance that they would intervene. I wonder about the 40%. Why wouldn't they? I can't ask them, but I can notice this. And I wonder if perhaps they simply don't know how to, right? Do they have all of the parts necessary? Their sense of self, their awareness of others, problem solving skills. You know, are they able to think through the consequences, how to act. Well, that might be what's holding those 40% of students back. Good news, social emotional skills are teachable in a school setting. Principals are committed to doing so. 75% of principals believe students from all types of backgrounds would benefit from SEL. They believe it because they see it. 76% of high schoolers want to attend a school that prioritizes SEL. Students know and feel 
when they're in socially and emotionally literate spaces. You can see it in their interactions, in their body language, right? in the way they interact with the adults, with their peers. Not only do high school students want to be at schools where social emotional learning is prioritized, some of them wish they simply had, right? After leaving high school, this is really interesting data. And this matches something that I've heard from colleagues in high schools in Maine, that students come back after high school and wish that they had had more of the social emotional learning, that they had had more practice with um, what soft skills, especially amongst people um, with a multiplicity right, of diversity, people from different places, different cultures. And so this is true for high school students who go to different parts of Maine, different parts of our country, different parts of our world, um, practicing and understanding how to be socially and emotionally literate is a skill that high school students wished they had been more prepared for, right? 41% believed that high schools did not do a great or a pretty good job preparing them, right? For jobs and careers or simply just for success. 48% of students did not share that they felt that they had been right, well prepared for success. And we know that social emotional learning does just that. 77% of students from high schools, this is not main data, 77% of high school students from schools that do prioritize it, so that they'd engage, right, in the civic engagement, military, national, public service. We know that uh, six of the top 10 in-demand career skills, complex problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, require socially and emotionally literate humans. Therefore, social emotional learning is good for the child, workforce, and society. Employers know this. They would prefer that their employees come with social, emotionally literate ways of being than the technical skills. Technical skills are easier to teach, right? Social, emotional learning has to be taught, understood, and practiced, and that takes time. Okay, top 10 skills, World Economic Forum. Problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, people management, coordinating with others, emotional intelligence, right? Understanding your emotions and, and why they come up and how to hold them. Judgment, decision-making, right? Orientation towards service, ability to negotiate, be flexible. We know that social emotional learning helps prepare humans to be successful in our world, right? Google, is looking for employees who are skilled communicators and listeners, have insights into others and have empathy, can have that values and emotional alignment. All state foundation, conflict resolution, leadership, civic engagement. And you know, we know from the Wall Street Journal that Bank of America, Subaru, they're paying for this training to happen. They know it's needed. They're investing in it. Remember that 11 to one? investment return, it's a thing. So luckily for you, the Maine Department of Education does not require that you make a financial investment um, to social emotional learning or in social emotional learning. You may have a program at your school or in your district that you're using. We also have lessons for you. We have a lesson library that we are constantly curating um, a fair amount of the content is about four or six years old. And that is significant, um, particularly because of the pandemic. And we know a lot more as research is coming out quickly now 
about the impact um, and the ways that we can strengthen the social emotional literacies students right and the impact that not having those is having um, on ourselves and our students and so we are updating these lessons um, if you come across a lesson and would like to give us some feedback on it there will be a form on our website you should be able to find one you can also reach out to me these lessons are arranged um, by grade span and also by competency. So whereas you may have invested in a program, um, there are fantastic resources out there. We also have a website with some resources and some other places to look to deepen your own understanding. We um, at the Maine Department of Education um, are also providing you um, with lessons and with our technical assistance. That's why Kelly Doyle Bailey and I are here. So you'll find that library arranged by competencies it's called SEL for me. And again, we will meet you where you are, whether it's with our free content, grounded practices, planning, how to embed SEL in your curricula. We're here. The heart of justice is truth telling, seeing ourselves and the world the way it is rather than the way we want it to be. More than ever before, we as a society need to renew a commitment to truth telling. The words of bell hooks align with this work we need to practice telling the truth about who we are in the world right the gifts that we bring seeing it in others right telling the truth about ourselves and knowing right knowing our truths so once again i'm sarah norsworthy i'm social emotional learning specialist the main department of education we have lessons for you um, my colleague and I uh, stand here um, ready to support you. If you would like to explore some of our other trainings, our 201s um, should be up soon if they're not up yet. Uh, and we are available to come um, and present and talk more about your social emotional learning needs. Thank you so much for taking the time to um, stick with me and stay with this uh, video. Um, if you would like uh, contact hours for watching this, uh, please reach out and I will send you a form to be able to um, record your learning that you did just about an hour here. Again, thank you so much for your time.